All right, chapter 36, The Cold War Begins, 1945 to 1952. Uh, a lot of very important laws and most importantly, uh, international uh, organizations and agreements are created during this time period. Uh, we even get a war, the Korean War. So the, this ends up being a fairly important chapter. Really, you know, until the end of the Vietnam War, which is in a few chapters, they're all important chapters. It's the the chapters post uh, Vietnam that tend to decrease in their importance. Okay, so you know, think about what's going on in America at this time. You had the Great Depression, which is you know the the entire decade of the 30s. You've got the World War II, which fixes the Great Depression, but now World War II is over, so the economy takes a hit, and a lot of people in uh, America thought we were sliding back into another Great Depression. You had this massive amount of government spending, uh, which creates, of course, uh, inflation. And so you see 33% inflation in 1946 to 1947. And so the the government, which at this time is controlled by the Republicans, they're starting to to panic, and they already had hated all of these Democrat creations from the previous two decades, and so st they start to roll back some of this type of stuff. And yet, at the same time, they don't roll back government spending. So it's kind of weird that you know these are these are Republicans from the 1940s uh, that that would not get along with the Tea Partiers of today. So the first major uh, bill that's passed is the Taft-Hartley Act, 1947, and it was an attack at organized labor. So it outlawed the, the closed shop. It made unions, um, you know, liable for for different disputes. And of course, there's the underlying current of fear of communism that had always existed with any type of labor organizations. And so the the, the spotlight starts to get shined on unions to to make sure that they're not uh, communist infiltrants. The Employment Act of 1946, um, it changes the nature of what the, the focus of government is. In, is the government going to try and promote employment? Which remember, you know, government in years past really had nothing to do with this prior to the Great Depression. If it was hands off big business, hands off labor. Well, now it is the policy of government to promote uh, the maximum employment so try and get that unemployment rate as low as possible now what are you going to do with these millions of soldiers who are returning to civilian life if they all try and go into the workforce you are going to have massive unemployment and if you're going to take away their their money right their check that they had earning as soldiers uh, you're also going to create a certain amount of destitution on their part as well Plus, you know, America had enjoyed all of that uh, soldier money that was being spent on various things. So they passed the GI Bill of Rights in 1944, and it basically meant that the soldiers could go uh, to school, to trade schools or to universities, uh, not completely free, but pretty close to free. And, you know, this is a way of delaying for several years. Uh, these soldiers going into the workforce. Instead of going to the workforce, they're going to go to school. And it's going to provide the, the economy a few years to figure out, you know, how do we you know, create jobs for these individuals. In addition to that, uh, the Veterans Administration, uh, they have this fantastic program that guarantees loans for veterans to buy homes. So even if the veterans, you know, don't have a ton of money to to make a down payment, or don't have you know, the greatest of credit, uh, the veteran, the VA, they're going to guarantee those loans. And so now, it creates a huge incentive for veterans of World War II to not just to rent, not to live in an apartment building, but to purchase a home. And what this then does is it spurs construction. Right? If you're a construction worker, uh, electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, uh, if you're a general contractor, if you're any of the related uh, industries in the creation of homes, uh, this is a massive boom for you because now America goes and they build millions of homes and they do so in the suburbs, which we're going to talk about later on. But you get 8 million uh, men and women, veterans, take advantage of these programs and they end up going to school. You see that 
enrollment in schools is so big, this is a picture from your book, that uh, veterans actually start to live in trailers um, at uh, the different colleges. So this is like a, a little neighborhood uh, of, uh, of college students, a little different than today. Their focus was a little different than also. They're a little older. They already have kids, which you can see here. Um, they dress a little bit different. It doesn't get to the colleges that uh, you see today, at college life, uh, until really the 1960s. Women. Remember, women were in the workforce in massive amounts during World War II. All the men were off fighting in Europe and in the Pacific, and someone needed to to build those bombs and bullets and planes and tanks and the factories, and that was that was women, right? That's Rosie the Riveter down here that you see. Um, are we just going to kick them out? And to a certain extent, yes. Uh, women left the workforce, uh, the the factory workforce, in large amounts right after World War II, and you know became wives and moms and all that, and that creates a certain uh, stress uh, that we're going to talk about next chapter, actually, but. A ton of jobs that were created uh, actually were created for for women. There are a lot of white collar uh, type jobs. If if you've seen uh, the the TV show Mad Men, uh, the the women that are working there, th those are the types of jobs that are created uh, during this time. It's not like women for the most part didn't go back into the factories, but it's white collar jobs. And really, it's white collar jobs that are created in general for men and women in the post war uh, boom. But you can see this is huge. Right, 1945, uh, a quarter of the American workforce is women, and by 2000, it's about 50/50. So that is huge. That that means that there are the, how many millions of women that wouldn't have had jobs uh, before uh, have jobs now. All of this really ends up creating uh, a lot of prosperity for the United States, and there's a lot of economists that you know kind of dispute how big of a boom it was because it's a lot of deficit spending and it's going to catch up with you uh, you know there's the the whole idea that we were the only superpower left in the world after World War II and so this creates you know a certain uh, advantageous position for us but a huge proponent or component of this post-war prosperity was the the increase in our military spending uh, later on during the Eisenhower administration? We're going to talk about the military-industrial complex, but the federal government starts spending uh, tons and tons and tons of money, and primarily on military items. So you can see outlays in billions of dollars here, right? Fairly low by today's standards in in 1950, 13.7 billion. Whereas in 2010, we're estimated at about 713. Now, that seems massive, but if you actually look at the, the percentage of our federal budget, um, it's actually slightly higher than it was in uh, 1940 and a lot less than it was in 1950. Also, Look at the percentage of our gross domestic product or gross national product. It's only 4.8, and it's been holding at 4.8 for a while. Uh, it rose a little bit after 9/11 uh, with the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars, but it's staying below 5%. Whereas you can see in 1960, when we were actually at peace, it was all the way up to 9.3%. So even though the increase in dollars and billions of dollars looks dramatic, um, the economy has grown. Uh, exponentially and so it, it just goes to show you though the, the massive amount of, of money that's being spent uh, even to this day on uh, the military by the, the federal government you know we're going to talk again next chapter a lot but you know the in the aftermath of world war ii the the soldier comes home the wife leaves the factory and you get the baby boom Right, this huge increase in children being born, and they move out to the suburbs because that's where the cheap land and the cheap houses that were the VA-backed uh, mortgages were at. And this is a, this is just a huge change in American culture. And part of that change is then uh, not just one car but two cars, right? A car for dad when he drives to and from work, and a car for mom as she drives the kids around school and to the to the different grocery stores and 
football practice and baseball practice and all that other stuff. Where are people moving? Well, you know, we started off on the East Coast there, and then there was a huge push into the Ohio River Valley way back in the, the early 1800s, and then there was a big uh, rush to California for the gold rush. And then at the start of the 20th century, there's the Great Migration, right, where tons of African Americans move from the south to the north to places like Chicago, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, uh, Detroit, which later becomes the Rust Belt. In the aftermath of World War II, you actually see the south and the southwest are the, the highest uh, increase in population. So people are moving south and they're moving to the southwest and a big reason for that is a lot of these military factories or these military jobs are uh, built in the south and, and in the west told you about the, the rush to the suburbs before and you get the FHA and the VA home loan guarantees it just makes it very uh, good to, to move out of your parents' house or to move out of an apartment in the city and to move out in the suburbs, especially after Eisenhower uh, builds the expressways, which we'll talk about next chapter. You see, we, this chapter and next chapter, they, they kind of go hand in hand with each other, so I refer to them both uh, a lot. Um, expressways make it possible that you can live you know, 30, 40 miles away from your job and still get there every day. I mean, I, I think I live about 32, 33 miles away from, from uh, Carmel, um, and I take the expressways the whole way there. You, you can see that the huge push, and by 1960, you know, a quarter of the American population lives in the suburbs. What I like here is check out this price. You know, it's a, it's a decent-sized ranch uh, for a total cost of $16,250. Baby boom. Massive increase in the birth rate 15 years after World War II. In addition to that, the birth rate was pretty low in the 1930s because nobody had any money. Right? People are living hand to mouth and you know, they're destitute and all that grapes of wrath type stuff. And in World War II, uh, there's not a whole lot of kids being born because, well, it takes two to tango and if all the men are in Europe or the Pacific, you're not getting a whole lot of births uh, in on the domestic side. Uh, but the guys come home after the war, they get married, or if they had already been married, they uh, <laughs> start their families, and uh, you can see this increase in birth rate, and it doesn't really start to go down until the 1960s. And then you see another uptick, and that's when the baby boomers start to have their own babies. Uh, baby boomats, I don't know. Um, and so basically, if you're born in the late 1970s or so, you're the children of baby boomers. Okay, switching from husbands and wives to another uh, tempestuous relationship, and that being uh, Churchill, FDR, and Stalin. And we're going to go back in time a little bit to 1945, shortly before uh, FDR dies, shortly before uh, the end of the war. We knew that the war was ending soon. Germany had fallen, uh, or was just about to fall, I should say, and Japan was being you know, pushed back further, closer and closer back to the main islands. And so the, the three big leaders, uh, they met to, what are we going to do after the war? Right. This is like a part two of Potsdam Conference that we talked about before. And we kind of got a raw deal out of this and a lot of pe reasons why we think we got a raw deal is because FDR uh, was dying right I mean he didn't have long to live you can see in these pictures he doesn't look so hot another thing is we were really worried uh, that the, the war was just going to drag on and on and on in Japan and that the Americans were going to suffer massive casualties if we invaded the, the mainland of Japan so we really wanted the Soviets uh, to declare war on Japan which they had yet to do and to, to help us with that invasion, to help us with that, that fight. And so we really sweetened the deal and gave the Soviet Union you know, a ton, way too much in the Alta Conference, and it really it changed the world for the worst for the next uh, several decades. 
and established some occupation zones in Germany uh, where each one of these major powers would have you know control of a geographic region within Germany and then we split the city of Berlin to geographic regions of control the problem with that is that Berlin actually is in East Germany um, and there was various other things. We started talking about the, the Korean Peninsula, which is going to pop up later on in this chapter, where we had these different zones of control as well. And Eastern Europe as well would have, you know, be, be under the influence of the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union wanted to create a, a buffer between themselves and Germany, because let's face it, they got invaded twice by Germany in Western Europe uh, in the previous 20, 30 years. They also discussed. You know, the League of Nations was dead, so they wanted to create something new, a new and improved version, and then later becomes the United Nations. This is just a map from your book, which shows the, the Soviet Union, and over here, their areas of influence. There in Eastern Europe, there is East Germany, um, and then most importantly for us, you're going to see here North Korea. Okay, so some more conferences, um, both military and financial. You get the Bretton Woods Conference, 1944, and the Western Allies, so not the communist countries, but those capitalistic democracies, uh, they create the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which is still around today. And it, its primary goal, in addition to uh, providing loans, is to try and regulate uh, the currency exchange rates. To, so to try and you know figure out a way to make the U.S. dollar uh, be worth a, a stable value as compared to other foreign currencies like the British pound, eventually the 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 EU um, euro, the, uh, the you know the the lira, the, all those other. Uh, currencies, uh, just so that they don't wildly fluctuate up and down, and to encourage countries not to print money like it's going out of style, like the Weimar Republic did, and you get cases like hyperinflation. Uh, this conference also created the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, which is still around today, and you know again, it's it's a way to try and bring up the third world or areas that are, you know suffer natural disasters or civil wars or invasions to try and rebuild them. Um, and then the, the most important one, probably all of this, is the United Nations. Maybe it's not the most important. It hasn't done a whole lot ever. Um, it, it's the successor to the League of Nations. It's founded in 1945. And within the United Nations, there's like a super council. It's called the Security Council. And that is comprised of the United States, Britain, Soviet Union, France, China, and regardless of what the General Assembly uh, passes, anybody on the Security Council has veto power. So it's weird if you want to think of it as these, you know, superimpose the American form of government over the United Nations, where you have the General Assembly is like Congress, and then you have five presidents. And any one of the five presidents can veto an action by the General Assembly. Because you have the U.S., Britain, and France on one side, although France has often vetoed some stuff, and the Soviet Union and China on the other side, it's very difficult to get something actually passed, especially if it's you know a, you know a military engagement around the world, because you're going to have these opposing superpowers, and they're always going to veto each other. So that's what I mean that not a whole lot actually gets done in the UN even to this day, because Russia. Uh, took up the vote that the Soviet Union used to have. Cool table from your book it shows international trade uh, ever since the, the end of World War II to 2008. And you can see the share of world exports. You know, at this time, even, even then, America was importing more than it was exporting. And so you can see, you know, it's held fairly stable for a while, and then it's really lowered in the last 20 years or so, where we're primarily just importing nonstop. Um, Europe has gone up a little bit, but it's kind of remained stable. Africa hasn't done jack ever. 
Uh, the Middle East, aside from oil, hasn't done a whole lot. But Asia, this is the big change, right? Asia was importing you know, 14% of the world's exports, and it's all the way up to almost 30% now. So that just gives you an idea of who's actually making stuff in the world nowadays. Okay, the, the Nuremberg trials. Um, so what do we do with these guys that were in charge of Nazi Germany? Hitler helped us out and he killed himself. But, you know, there's a bunch. You know, you got Hermann Goering here, Rudolf Hess, a bunch of the other Nazi dudes here. And, you know, they were the architects, right, of the Holocaust. They were the architects of the invasion of Eastern Europe and Western Europe and committing all of these horrible atrocities. And, they're, you know, they're, their excuse was basically, you know, Hitler told me to do it. So we put them on trial, and uh, you know we end up, you know, killing a bunch. Let me see what the the exact total is. So twelve were executed, seven were sentenced to long jail terms, and uh, Gehring there uh, apparently committed suicide uh, right before he was taken to the gallows, and Hess to sit to his left, I guess, this is Hess, this is Gehring, this is Hess. Hess uh, committed suicide in his jail cell. Oh well. So, I said before, there's these different occupation zones uh, within Germany. And then there's Berlin, which is in the Russian occupation zone, uh, is itself split up into different ones. And eventually they kind of consolidate and you get the, the U.S., France, and British ones are turned into one, and that would be West Berlin. The problem is that West Berlin is completely surrounded by East Germany. And a lot of people from East Germany were fleeing, were defecting, as it were, into West Berlin. Uh, and obviously, you know, West Germany was economically doing better than East Germany. So this looks bad for communism, and it looks bad for the Soviet Union. So eventually the Soviet Union just blocks off all access to West Berlin there in 1948, thinking that we would just give up and they would take over the entire uh, city. We didn't, and so we actually used our bombers. And here you can see uh, a picture of a bomber. These are the same planes that dropped bombs on Berlin four years before uh, now start to drop supplies into West Berlin. And they did so nonstop around the clock for about a year. And it was a huge demonstration of military force that we could do this. Um, but we're doing it for this altruistic you know, charity so that the people of West Berlin uh, don't bow down to these communist oppressors. And after about a year, uh, the Soviet Union just kind of you know, opened up the roads and the, uh, the, the railroad lines again so that you know, people from West Berlin could come and go. But what they start to do, and you'll see this, you know, about ten years later, is they they build the the Berlin Wall, where they encircle um, West Berlin with this big wall to try and keep Germans, East Germans, Communist Germans, uh, from defecting into West Berlin. This is just a map from your book, which shows you the different occupation zones of uh, Germany, and then the the small map within that is uh, then Berlin itself. The reason why I said that Yalta was so such a bad deal for uh, the United States is, I mean, look, the Soviet Union is just one of these four uh, military powers that was at the conference, and yet the Soviet Union basically gets half of everything. So if what's fair is fair, they should get 25%. So, Stalin's still alive, FDR's dead, World War II is over, um, but you're starting to see these Eastern European countries teetering on the brink of going communist, and you start to see uh, nations like Poland, and Czechoslovakia, and some of the other countries, Romania, they just go straight commie. And it's because they're in that zone of control by the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union is looking to spread its control uh, over many areas. And eventually, it, it, for unrelated reasons, China goes from 
uh, really a dictatorship, but it, it goes kind of under Mao Zedong. Uh, China becomes communist, and then a quarter of the world's population, uh, poof, becomes part of the bad guys under the Soviet uh, dominance. So you get this uh, Russian specialist, uh, a diplomat, an American diplomat by the name of George F. Kennan, and he comes up with containment doctrine. And it's a theory of his, his study of the, the Soviet people and their history. And it was his opinion that uh, the Russians are always expansionary, but also very, very cautious. And if faced with a military blockade if you, in a certain spot, then they will not uh, advance in that area. So his advice was that the United States should block the Soviets at every point in Europe or in Asia or and beyond. And that will prevent uh, the, the Soviet Union from spreading its influence. If it doesn't, then you get something called the domino theory that once one country becomes communist then its neighbor is going to come become communist and so on and so on and so on so we kind of saw that in eastern europe as these countries slowly became communist one right after the other and they were all bordered each other harry truman is the president at this time after fdr dies and he totally believes this containment doctrine and then he engages in the actual uh, fulfillment of these blockages. And so that becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. So basically the Truman Doctrine and the Containment Doctrine or Containment Theory are basically one and the same. And they're both meant to try and prevent the Domino Theory uh, from uh, coming to fruition. And so the, the next two countries that we're, we're worried about uh, were Greece and Turkey. Greece had been kind of a, a British colony at this time period. And Britain didn't have any more money because of World War II. And communist elements in Greece were starting to getting close to come to power. And under the domino theory, if Greece fell to the commies, this meant that probably neighboring Turkey would as well. So what Truman does in order to invoke the Truman Doctrine, using the tenets of the Containment Doctrine, is he asks Congress for $400 million, which he gives to Greece and Turkey to keep them on our side of the Iron Curtain to keep them good good guys. Kind of related to this uh, to this containment doctrine is the Marshall Plan. It was put in place really by Secretary of State George Marshall and he basically talked to all the different uh, nations in Western Europe, our buddies, you know, France, Belgium, Britain, and said, hey, you know, you guys get together and try and come up with a joint plan for your economic recovery. You're all a bunch of little nations on this one big continent. Perhaps you should, you know, try and, you know, grow together and have agreements as opposed to constantly invading each other. And if you do so, the United States will provide you loans. So we'll we'll back you financially. And it works and it eventually leads to the European Community, which is known as the EC. And at some point, I think it was in the 90s, uh, the EC changed their name to the EU. And that's what we have. So it's basically the EU can trace its lineage all the way to the Marshall Plan 1947. This is just a political satire uh, from your book uh, concerning the Truman Doctrine. And it basically shows, wow, this is this is new territory uh, for America. We were always kind of isolationist before, and here we are with a, a big old bag of money. Uh, hopefully, hopefully our leaders know what they're doing because it could go very bad. This is another graphic from your book, um, which shows United States foreign aid, both military and economic, uh, primarily. The, the chief part of that was the Marshall Plan. And you can see there, $35 billion uh, to Europe. Um, another you know, 8 to $9 billion uh, to Asia, and most of that was actually to Japan. And then you can see you know, fairly low amounts, microscopic amounts really, uh, to the third world. This is just a picture from your book. Again, the Marshall Plan, and it, it just shows the difference of 
how America treats its defeated foes in wars. You know, you already saw the those bomb bombers that were dropping goods, food, and supplies to West Berlin that had been dropping bombs, you know, just four years before. And here you have this poster uh, showing the the amount of money that were given West Germany, and the the quote is Berlin rebuilt with help from the Marshall Plan. So we bomb your city to oblivion, and then we pay for it to be rebuilt. J America. This is actually a Russian cartoon, kind of depicting the same thing, and it, it's basically that we're dangling the carrot in, in front of all these European nations. That carrot, of course, is American money uh, to try and draw them away from communism and towards America's influence. Uh, it's true, right? I mean, it's the, they, they're not lying in this this cartoon. That is what America wanted to do, because the alternative was that they would run in the other direction towards the Soviet Union. So, you know, I showed you the graphic towards the beginning of this lecture about the, the massive amounts of military spending that starts to occur in the 1950s and 1960s, this military-industrial complex. Well, the, there are laws, right, that start all this. And, you know, the first one is the National Security Act, 1947. It actually creates the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense, it kind of it brings all the different branches of the military kind of together under one leadership. It's headquartered in the Pentagon, and it's headed by a new cabinet officer uh, called the Secretary of Defense. So this gets rid of the Secretary of War, Secretary of the Army, Secretary of the Army, all of that uh, is gotten rid of, and now there's just the one Secretary of Defense. This National Security Act also creates the National Security Council, which is still in existence today. Uh, if you see those cool pictures of the president in a war room with a bunch of TVs and a bunch of guys, you know, in, in military uniforms, all you know, circled around a table, especially like when we we killed Bin Laden and you know invaded a couple other you know Libya and stuff like that. Uh, that was the National Security Council that you saw. They basically they advised the president on security and military matters. This act also creates the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, which is our spy agency. Right, We try and gather as much information about foreign countries and individuals as possible uh, so that we can react and uh, act on that information when needed. Shortly after this, we also create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, otherwise known as NATO. NATO is still around, and it was a military alliance with Western Europe. It basically, you had all of these Eastern European countries uh, being armed by the Soviet Union, and we were worried about the domino theory, and so as part of the containment theory, or the Truman Doctrine, uh, we form into a peacetime military alliance, which really we had never done before, and we absolutely hated that one that we kind of had in the 1790s with France. So it shows you how unique uh, NATO was. And it's basically just meant to, to stop the westward expansion of the Soviet Union and any attack by any of the western uh, countries by the Soviet Union would be considered an attack on all of these western countries um, and that's that's the deal. This is just a cartoon from your book talking about the formation of NATO. It really is the end of American isolationism. You know, nowadays we talk about America and it's, it's Team America World Police, right? Uh, th that wasn't the case for most of our history, though. We were we tended to be an extremely isolationist country. You know, remember we didn't even get involved in World War One until the very, very end, and we didn't even get involved in World War Two until well over a year after the fighting started. You know, Britain was on its last legs and we didn't get involved. France was totally gone. We didn't get involved. Uh, not until Pearl Harbor, December of 1941. So we were very isolationist. And ever since the formation of NATO, we've been just the opposite. We've been actually very, very aggressive in our foreign diplomacy and foreign military action. All right, you get this Red Scare. This is the second Red Scare in American history. The first one happens in the aftermath of World War I, second in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, in the late 1940s, all of a sudden the Soviet Union blows up an, an atomic bomb. 
which we thought this was several years before they would have the capability to do so. So we freak out. We do some investigation, and it turns out that they stole the plans for the atomic bomb from us. There was a lot of different spies, but the, the most well-known ones are Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who you know, I don't know, somehow got the, the plans to the bomb and hid it in pumpkins on their front porch and all this other stuff. Um, they were convicted of espionage in 1951, and they were fried on the electric chair in 1953. Uh, it's the first uh, people ever to be uh, killed on the account of espionage in American history. Uh, we had this thing called the House on Un-American Activities Committee ever since 1938, but it really gets ramped up into high gear in the 1950s, especially by the senator from Wisconsin, of all places, called Joseph McCarthy, who's a Republican. And he waves this list of, he claimed that there are all these names of individuals who worked for the federal government who were secretly members of the Communist Party. And by implication, they're going to be spies as well. And so he, he becomes a bigwig on the, on the HUAC committee, and they just they have subpoena power, and, and they can drag people before uh, the committee, and they just grill them. I mean, it's like a hor horrible cross-examination. And the questions they ask oftentimes have nothing to do with whether a person is a communist or not. And if you lied about it, tried to keep any secrets, then you would get convicted of perjury, and that's how you would get thrown in prison. So he absolutely wrecks you know, hundreds, if not thousands of lives. Tons of people in Hollywood um, were were blacklisted, that they were they were prevented, they, their careers were ruined. Um, he really targeted government employees, uh, people in education, uh, people in Hollywood, but always Democrats, right? This was a very political attack, and because his assumption was that Democrats were already basically communists to begin with, and so that that's how it goes. Once he starts attacking the, the army, uh, and then you get this Alfred R. Murrow from Channel 2, or CBS, I should say, uh, starts to do some investigations and finds out that this list is complete BS and he's just doing these you know, hate-mongering and attacks. Uh, he's disgraced and he ends up drinking himself to death by the late 1950s. Richard Nixon uh, actually becomes kind of well-known as one of these uh, Red Scare pit bulls. Uh, he's a congressman. And he accuses this kind of uh, Democrat uh, popular guy from the Eastern establishment, Alger Hiss, of being a communist agent. And he, he attacks him, and again, Hiss you know, basically just gets caught in a bunch of lies about other things. And so Hiss ends up getting convicted of perjury. This makes Richard Nixon uh, well-known as this big communist hunter, and it propels him then to the vice presidency under... Eisenhower, and then of course that propels him to a series of campaigns in the 1960s, culminating in the presidency in 1968. There's a young Dick Nixon examining some microfilm uh, that was evidence in the Elgar Hiss conviction for perjury in 1950. Truman, right, he becomes president after FDR dies in 1945. Um, he then runs uh, for president under his own doing, and there's this big scandal because Dewey, the Republican nominee, uh, appeared to win. The voting was so close, 2000 style, uh, and even the, the Chicago Tribune uh, on the night of the election uh, printed Dewey defeats Truman. And it turns out after they count all the votes the next day that Truman, in fact, defeats Dewey. So Truman is the president until 1952. Korea. So we had these, so the Soviet Union declares war on Japan basically in August of 1945, right as the atomic bombs are dropping. As part of the deal, they got to control the northern half of the Korean Peninsula. So for the last five years, that's what the Soviet Union was doing, and they institute their own communist puppet regime under Kim Jong. Kim Jong, of course, invades South Korea at the end of June 1950, and we freak out. Right? There's this big, you know, do we just let the Korean Peninsula go total commie? Or do we fight back? So it, there's this big debate, and it also fears us into, you know, wow, we have to 
not just worry about the containment theory in Europe, but now everywhere around the world, and that's the case. And so if we're going to do that, we better increase our military spending. So you get NSC 68, which recommends that the U.S. actually quadruple its defense spending, and by, I think it was 1958, if I remember right, it approaches 13% actually of the gross national product. Remember, nowadays it's 4.8%. So the Korean War, there's there's not a whole lot to talk about, uh, <laughs> even though we're still at war with North Korea, uh, whether it be militarily or cyber warfare. But so by the late summer of 1950, North Korea controls almost all of South Korea. I think the next slide I have a map that will show you. Uh, General MacArthur of Pacific fame from World War II is given the task to fight uh, the North and North Korea. So he does a sneak attack, basically, at a place called Incheon, uh, which I'll show you is right by Seoul, uh, deep behind enemy lines. And he does this in September 1950, and within two weeks, the North Koreans have retreated all the way across the 38th parallel, which was the original border. MacArthur just doesn't stop, though, at the 38th parallel. He invades the north. Eventually, he gets too close to the Yalo River, which is the border between China and North Korea. And China invades North Korea, but not to fight the North Koreans, but to fight us. So the Chinese start to fight the, United, the U.S. And, of course, the Chinese have an infinite number of soldiers. They just send wave after wave after wave, even though the casualties are atrocious. And, China's case, you know, hundreds of thousands of them die to the low hundreds of ours. Uh, they are actually because just by sheer volume uh, to push us south all the way back to basically the 38th parallel. So what you get is a stalemate, and this stalemate uh, exists then for about two years. Uh, even though North Korea and the United States start to have negotiations in 1951, they, they negotiate and they, they bitterly argue about the size of the table, the shape of the table, about prisoners, about everything you could possibly think of uh, for two years until finally they sign an armistice. Uh, basically, an armistice is just a ceasefire. We're going to stop the immediate hostilities um, and then we're going to sign a peace treaty afterwards. Well, we're still waiting for that peace treaty to be signed. So, you could say technically, uh, since June of 1950, we have been at war with North Korea. So this is the, the map I was telling you about. This is the 38th parallel. North Korea invades the south. They All the way down to this southern, southeastern tip uh, by Pusan uh, is how far the North Koreans pushed us. And the span of about three months or so, two and a half months. Then you get the infamous Incheon landing right by Seoul, and you can see MacArthur pushes the North Koreans all the way back north up here, but they get too close to this river, the Yalu River, and that's when China invades. And the China pushes us all the way back to, and this is the modern boundary. So you can see this is the 38th parallel. This is the current boundary. And what happens at this boundary? Over here, this is the demilitarized zone. This is the place where North Koreans, South Koreans, the United States, they can actually have meetings. And when, within these buildings is actually neutral territory. It's just a series of tables. There's nothing exciting. But this is a picture taken from each side. So this is taken picture from the South Korean side. These are South Korean soldiers and United States soldiers. And see this like rose, like about a foot high. This is technically the border between North Korea and South Korea. It's guarded by both sides nonstop. Um, here is a North Korean uh, border headquarters, basically right here. And now this is a picture taken from the opposite side. This is from the North Korean side. I have no clue who took this picture, how they were able to get it. And you can see they're right here on uh, the border. And then this is. You know the the South Korean border headquarters on this side. Um, it's basically a big tourist area for us. You can see these are all tourists in the background now, um, but it's serious business uh, for the North. So this is a political cartoon from your book. Um, MacArthur actually gets fired by Truman because when China invades, uh, MacArthur wants to 
you know, start attacking Manchuria. He wants to drop atomic bombs on the Chinese, and Truman wouldn't let him. And so then, actually, MacArthur uh, starts to talk bad about. I'm sorry, MacArthur starts to talk bad about Truman uh, to the newspapers. Well, even though MacArthur probably was right, and from a military strategic standpoint, you don't want to fight a limited war. Uh, you don't want to fight with one arm tied behind your back. Uh, you can't talk bad about your commander, right? And the general's commander is the commander-in-chief. That's the president of the United States. And so he gets fired. Well, that's it for Truman. He's toast because everybody loved MacArthur. So MacArthur comes back to the United States as basically this hero. And lots of parades and cheering. Whereas the public opinion of Harry Truman uh, was toast. Uh, that was it for the rest of his career. Uh, he was pretty much hated. And this is it. This is the last uh, slide. I was able to get it done in about 45 minutes. You can see the GI Bill of Rights, or, or not sorry, the, the GI Bill is passed in 1944. You get the Yalta Conference in 1945. Uh, the UN is established in 45. The Nuremberg Trials, 45-46. Uh, you get the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Taft-Hartley Act, and the National Security Act, all in 47, probably the biggest uh, year from this chapter. Uh, you get uh, Truman defeats Dewey in 48, the Berlin Blockade with the Berlin Airlift, 48-49, NATO is established in 49. Uh, you get the McCarthyism beginning in 1950, the Korean War, 50-53, to 53. Uh, Truman fires MacArthur, 51. And uh, then you get uh, the baby boomers. There you go.